All right, well, it's Chop Saw City here. I have three different models of Evolution Chop Saws that we're gonna take a look at in this video today. I have thousands of cuts I've made with each of these different models. This is their base model of 14 inch chop saw. I purchased one of these years ago, not this exact unit, but the same model and used it for a long time. And I've since upgraded a couple of times and I've also partnered with them. They've sent me some of the tools that you've seen me use here on the channel. I've seen some of the features that are really nice as well as some of the little quirks and gripes that I have about them. And I can share those with you too. I won't hold back on that. Now, the things that you get with a uh, chop saw like this, first let's talk about the pros and then the cons. The pros are one, they're really portable and easy to move around. And I don't have a lot of space in my shop, so that's a must compared to like a big horizontal bandsaw. They're also fast to cut through and they give a really accurate cut and can give a great fit up if you get everything measured and marked just right. Also, the cuts coming off of one of these are just super clean. They require very little cleanup and they're cool to the touch right after you cut them. So there's a lot of good stuff going on with one of these, especially for the compact size. You don't have to deal with like a flood coolant or anything like that. Now there are some downsides to using one of these. And then the biggest one for me is just the little chips that cut off get all over the place. Now each of these saws, we'll look at them in detail, but each one of these has a device in place to catch a lot of those. And it is somewhat effective. However, when you're cutting tubing, the uh, chips actually get trapped inside the tubing as you cut and they come out the end. That's the biggest source of spread for these chips that, that you get. And you also have some that uh, scatter off the sides of the blade or whatnot. So, so that's a big downside for me. The second one is just that they're really loud. So when you're cutting through these, uh, ear protection is a must. Let's go ahead and look at these particular saws and let's start off with what they have in common because there's a lot. Now from the hinge point on the saws up, they're all identical with one exception, at least from what I can tell. They have the same motor on them. They have a gearbox that reduces the speed down to 1450 RPM. And the 15 amp motor that you've run, I've never had an issue with power on any of these where I, I wished uh, it, it had more power. So they're, they're good from that perspective. The handle, I think the ergonomics are nice. The way that it's oriented is good with a large uh, trigger to grab so you don't wear out a finger pulling on one button. The safety lockout works well, but it's also pretty convenient uh, when you go to use it. So it's nice from that perspective. The carry handle's in a good spot, pretty straightforward on that, and a fully shrouded blade. Now that's where there's a difference with this saw compared to the other two. This shroud uh, on this saw is actually slightly larger than the other two because this S380 can actually handle a 15 inch or 380 millimeter diameter blade where these other two max out at 14 inch blades. And the only reason you'd really need to run a 15 inch blade, which I've never run one by the way, uh, is to cut a little bit larger tubing. It'll get you up to being able to cut a 90 degree angle on five inch square tubing where these other two will fall a little bit short on that. Blade changes are the same across the board. They all have an Allen wrench with built-in storage, which is nice, a spindle lock, and you simply just remove the screw right there and the blade can slide off. There are different blades for different types of materials, and if you are cutting much aluminum or stainless steel, it's worth getting the right kind of blade. From the hinge point down, there are a lot of differences between these different saws. And we're gonna dive into each one of those because it makes a significant difference to the way that you work. So over here on the base model, the S355 CPSL, it has a stamped steel base, which is obviously gonna be the least expensive to manufacture, and that's how they're able to offer this at a lower price. Now you move up to the S380 CPS, this one has a cast aluminum base and has some extra features to catch chips and also to be able to more quickly align your angle. When you go up to the mitering chop saw, the S355 uh, MCS, this one actually has a full miter saw style base. Now I'll go ahead and just start with the base model and work my way up and go through in detail with a bunch of different cut examples and uh, just try to illustrate some of the things that I've learned over the years using these different saws. So this is the S355 CPSL. It's their base model version and it has just a plain stamped steel base. We'll take a look at uh, in a little bit more detail here. 
So if I flip it over, you can see that it's pretty ordinary. It has a couple of stiffening ribs on it, and it has this plate underneath with slots in it to keep the chips from just flying straight out the bottom, though they do just drop out of the bottom. There's no kind of tray or anything to catch them in there. The thickness of this is right around 75 thousandths of an inch, if uh, you're wondering. And up here it has these three different rubber feet, but on the fourth it actually has a steel foot that's welded on. I assume that's because the chips fly back and would hit that rubber foot. With regards to chip collection, there's really just this deflector right there that keeps them from flying out the back and dropping down. Now let's take a look at the clamping mechanism. I'll take off the fence here at the back. So I can remove that by uh, removing that hand screw and then also using the included Allen wrench to remove the shoulder screw. It's really nice how all of the Allen screws on this are the same size hex, so you can use the same wrench for everything. So that's a pretty good detail. This is a heavy cast piece and it has a nice degree indicator on it. And then this uh, shoulder screw allows it to pivot really easily and you just use the hand screw to tighten it down in place. With the fence removed, we can take a look at the actual mount for the saw. It's once again formed out of sheet metal, but it's a little heavier gauge. There's a stop to control how deep it goes, so you can adjust that, as well as a lock to hold it down, which is much nicer than a chain that I had on a different model of saw that I used to own. So it's, it's a good mechanism there. There are three different mounting locations for the fence. You can move it forward and back. Let me start off by putting it in the middle location and I can show you one of the issues you run into. Now this is a nice uh, die cast metal piece, at least it feels like it's not plastic there and it can be reoriented when you lock it in place. Now here with it in the middle position, if I set it to 45 degrees, uh, just stock out of the box, this is a brand new saw, the unit itself. Now watch as I cut through at 45 degrees, I'm going to bottom out the saw before it actually makes it all the way through my piece. And so that's one issue why you'd move that fence forward and back, and I generally tend to have it towards the front. The other reason that you would move it to different positions is to avoid having the blade uh, run right against a flat surface, because that wears on your blade and it cuts uh, more slowly and generates a lot of heat. So you wanna have it positioned such that it's cutting uh, vertically to some extent. I generally position it right up towards the front and that works well. Now another way that you could cut through uh, all the way on the back is I could have dropped that stop so it would go down a little bit further, but just for the sake of demonstration I left it in the stock position. And you can see when I moved it to the front it cut really well and that's a pretty accurate cut for fabrication. It's good enough for most things that I do. If you wanted to fine tune it you can actually slide that degree indicator around. On this particular saw, it's a little bit difficult to see the degree indicator sometimes if you have the light shaded by that, so I use the light there. Now this is a block to allow you to position material at 45 degrees. Like I mentioned, it's better if you don't cut against flat surfaces, so when you're making straight cuts on uh, square tubing, you can use this to position it. Now this will only fit like two inch and larger square tubing from my experience. So if I'm working with like one inch square tubing, I just have it sit flat. Or if you're cutting a miter, you usually have to have it sit flat. But it cuts through really well when you have it sitting vertically like that. And once again, you'd want it to sit vertically if you are cutting through a flat bar like this rather than running flat on the face. And you can see how it just cruises right through it really well. Uh, no issues at all there. So if you are having a lot of blade wear, maybe look at the orientation of the part. Make sure you're cutting vertically. I usually get thousands of cuts out of a single blade. So here with angle iron, once again, I'll do the same thing. But angle iron can get pretty frustrating when it comes to miters. I'll show you in a minute. Now notice if I use that block with this smaller angle iron, there's a gap underneath. And I don't want that material hanging out there when I'm cutting. So I'm going to just remove that block entirely and have it sit against the fence. And that's worked pretty well for me to make straight cuts on angle iron. And we'll see how that cruises through there. Should be no problems here because once again, we're cutting vertically through it. it works great. The challenge with angle iron comes when you set this to make a miter cut. And this is one of the most difficult things with a regular chop saw like this. You can clamp it in one direction like this, and that works okay. It feels, uh, you know, it's, it's not my favorite thing to do, but it generally will lock in because the way that the blade is rotating, it's pulling that back face into the fence, 
and just uh, supporting the clamping position there. However, if you want to cut the opposite uh, miter um, to that and you need to position it, like to have the lip on the outside, if I turn this around and then clamp it with the uh, flat bar against the clamp, I wouldn't ever do this because look what can happen when your blade pulls backwards, it can pop that out of position and that's not gonna be a safe condition. Now some people I've seen use clamping blocks like this. I try to avoid that, so I usually use a different tool if I'm mitering angle iron because you know holding it like that isn't gonna work well. The other big complaint I have about a regular chop saw is that the fence moves relative to the saw. So if you have a station set up, like I used to have one of these set up as my cut station, see how the long piece goes to the side. So you actually have to rotate the saw to have room for your material. So that's another downside of, of one of these chop saws. Cut, mitering angle iron is one, and number two is going to be just having to reorient the saw. And those drawbacks will apply to both traditional chop saw models, but not the mitering chop saw. Now we'll move on to the S380. Notice it has those cutouts for your hands in the cast base. That's really nice to be able to carry it around compared with the uh, 355, and it doesn't have those, so you have to use the handle up high, which can be a little awkward for taller positions. Let's take a look under here. You can see with that cast base, there's a lot more ribbing. That's just gonna add to durability over time. Right here on this chip deflector, above that is actually a tray. It's a big drawer that slides out. We'll look at in a minute to catch some. You can see it has three rubber feet once again, and then the one cast in aluminum back here by the back side of the blade. Now I'll remove the fence on top, and we can take a good look at this. It's a very similar piece. I think it's the same base casting as the other one, except that it has this spring plunger on it that will detent into two additional holes that are drilled down in the base. This allows you to quickly align to zero and 45 degrees, and it'll just snap right into place. And that can be a pretty good time savings. You know, it seems like it's not too big of a deal to just look at the scale, and it's not, but if something saves you five or 10 seconds every time you move it back and forth, you can add up to hit, you know, thousands of cuts pretty fast. There are a lot of cuts even on a simple project. So having little conveniences like that are big time savings. Also, there's a little indicator that's cast right into the base. So you can see 15, 30, and 45 degrees just by looking there in the front without having to use the indicator. The actual clamping mechanism is the same. As far as chip collection goes, obviously you can have the chips fly out the end like I talked about earlier. That's gonna be an issue with any chop saw, but it has a much better uh, shoot at the back to catch it as well as the slot, and both of those empty into a drawer at the back. Let's go ahead and slide that out and I'll show you what I'm talking about. So I just use the Allen key and loosen the latch here, and it's spring-loaded to pop it out a little bit. I need to raise the blade up to get it the rest of the way out. It's been my experience that this tray fills up really fast. You know, you remove quite a bit of material, and so you end up having to empty it out. Now, there is still some sweeping to do on the floor, but all of those chips right there that are caught, those are the ones that would be underneath the saw. And so you ha if you have it sitting in a station somewhere, it's really nice to be able to catch that so you can clean it out and put it back without having to move your saw and sweep or use a magnet underneath it. So I think it is a good feature, but it doesn't save from cleaning up. Let's go ahead and do a little cutting with this. It's the same saw as the other one that this blade itself probably has a thousand or more cuts on it where the other one was brand new and it still cuts through really well. So that's one thing I love about them. If you treat them right, they'll work uh, really well. Now with the miter cut, once again, it'll just cruise right through. The saw itself is basically the same as the other one. So the big thing that you get are those convenience factors with the base compared to the CPSL. The actual cutting performance is going to be very similar. Once again, a really nice cut, even though this blade has quite a bit of use on it. Let's go ahead and make one more cut with some thick uh, quarter inch thick angle here and you can see it just moves right through. I travel a little bit more slowly with this. Like, like I said before, power's never been an issue with any of these saws, but I do regulate my speed when I'm cutting through something a little bit thicker and it uh, can still come out really nice like this. Let's take a look at that cut finish. And it just has that uh, unique almost machined look, but there's almost no burrs and it's pretty much ready for fabrication. Now let's take a look at the mitering chop saw right here. It's uh, much larger as you can see, there's a lot more going on. It's sitting on a base that I built on a video quite a while back with a chute to catch a lot of the chips. 
and drop them down in this bucket. You can see it does catch quite a bit, and it's also nice that my little ends I can just drop off and uh, put them down in the bucket there. There isn't built-in collection, so if I hadn't built this, all of that would just drop through. The attachment point for the saw head is a lot more complex. It actually has a cam that rotates to adjust your stop rather than a screw that goes in and out, and a very similar lock mechanism to latch it uh, in the down position. Rather than different positions for the fence, you can actually slide the whole saw head forward and back, similar to a sliding miter saw, and then lock it in place. Because of this, I'm much more likely to use it in the ideal position because it's so easy to move. Now let's take a look at the base itself. It's heavy duty and it actually has those grooves for handles cast into it. Mine's bolted down, but uh, it is somewhat portable, but quite a bit heavier than the others. You can see there's a lot of ribbing on the back and a pretty complicated clamping mechanism. Let me pull all those clamps off and get them out of the way so that we can just take a look at the saw base itself first. Now similar to a miter saw, though a little bit more heavy duty than, than some, you have this sliding mechanism. It'll latch in place at common angles, 15, 22 and a half, uh, 45 degrees. And then the degree indicator gives you a good idea of where you are, even if you wanted to stop in between. And when you hit your angle, you can latch it down just with the screw knob there like that. So it works really well. Also, since it pivots in both directions, you can keep your material oriented the same way. So I can leave this set up in my cut station and it's always pointed off to the side with plenty of room for my material. Now this clamp bar at the front, that's what the clamps actually connect to, and it's adjustable in height. And I can slide the clamps onto the end. It's pretty simple like that. And on the face of each of these clamps, there are actually two different uh, spring-loaded balls here, you can see. And those are used to hold those angle blocks, similar to what you have on the other saw in place, but they're much smaller here. So you can actually put smaller tubing at an angle than you can on the regular chop saws. So those slide on and attach really well. And that's, that's been a, a pretty nice feature, though I don't use it too often. There are multiple positions for the vertical clamp to slide in and it just slides into place and then it's pretty nice because it has this uh, quick acting release so you can quickly run it down to your material and tighten it up and lift it up there. Let's go ahead and cut uh, some example tubing here. We'll start off just with a miter cut at 45 degrees. You can see putting all three clamps on here does on the one hand give a lot of security because both sides are clamped securely in place and you don't have anything loose that could be caught in the blade or anything like that. So I like that, but it does take more time. Like notice how much longer it takes to actually clamp things down, uh, especially when you switch between different types of tubing. But at the end of the day, you do get a nice cut. And I, I do feel like my cuts are a little bit more accurate with this saw than they were with the regular chop saw when I was using that. So I like it. Once again, the cut quality is, is the same. All three of these use that same saw, and uh, it just it works really well. There's no uh, two ways about that. Now let's try putting some of this square tubing up at an angle, and I'll show you what I'm talking about with the adjustable height. So I can just latch these two in place to get my height figured out. And then there are a couple of thumb screws that I use to hold that bar at the right height and then lock everything down in place. So this, you can see it takes a bit more time just moving more clamps around. And once you've got it in place, then, uh, then you're good to go. Now we'll slice through this. And once again, no issue there. It just melts right through. That's in real time speed. And this blade probably has, uh, I don't know, it's, it's more than a thousand cuts on it and it's, it's still running good. So uh, no issues there. Now you can see that for a second cut on the same material, it's really not that much time to actually uh, clamp it once again because those clamps have been uh, used in that position already. So when it comes to mitering angle iron, it's just a breeze with this saw, and that's a really nice feature because you can clamp everything right down in place against the back fence and the base datum there and just get a nice cut. Since the head pivots either direction, you can miter either way that you want. It's just a, a really good setup for that. 
right? Well, at the end of the day, you can see that each one of these cut metal really well. So there's a big price difference across the range here. And you might be wondering, all right, well, which one should I actually get? Well, it depends on what you're going to be doing. So if you are a pro or you are making a lot of uh, different miter cuts, or you just want that extra security of the additional clamping, I think that the mitering chop saw is the hands down winner here for one all around tool. It really solves a lot of the things that uh, I complained about with these other two. That being said, it does take a little bit more time to clamp things in place and that uh, if you're just making a bunch of straight cuts might lead you towards getting one of these. The other thing about it is it's big and heavy. So if you need to take this with you all over the place, I might think about getting just one of the regular chop saws instead. Now out of these two, there are a lot of similarities. You save a little bit of time with the uh, lock-in pins for the different angles on the S380 here. Also the chip collection tray is there. However, you end up having to sweep up anyway. So I don't think the chip collection tray is a big selling point for me. So I guess I would say that if you're fabricating more than maybe one day a week, it's probably worth the extra hundred bucks to go with the S380, or if you need that larger blade capacity compared to the CPSL. But in general, for most people doing hobby work at home or occasional fabrication, and they're just using it uh, here and there when needed, this is an awesome saw and a really good choice. And I honestly think it's a great value for what they charge for it. I have links for each of these saws down in the description below. Uh, they are affiliate links, which provide a small commission to the channel. I'd never want anyone to buy anything just because I have a link there. But if you are going to buy one anyway, I appreciate your support by uh, using those links. That's what makes it possible to be able to make these videos. Hey, thanks a ton for tuning in. We'll see you next time.